Bridgetown, the capital of Barbados, has an area of less than 40 square kilometers and a population of 100,000. Bridgetown serves as a political, economic, cultural and transportation center for the island and also as a trading hub for the East Caribbean region. But for mighty Gabby, Bridgetown has a more important place in his heart. It's his hometown. When I was a boy, um, you know, since I was about seven, eight years old, I was going into the market to buy produce, to buy uh, fruits and vegetables for my mum, especially on Saturday mornings. Uh, the women would come to town, to Bridgetown, and they would bring the produce, the yams, potatoes, and pumpkins, bananas, to sell. And they were very beautifully dressed. You know, it looked very African to me. You know, the head ties and the clothes. So um, that picture remained in my head for years. And I sat one day and took up my guitar. And the song just came in a few minutes. It was, it was finished because Inspiration. Mighty Gabby was in his early 30s when he wrote this song, a song he has sung for 30 years now, and one every Barbadian has memorized due to its simple lyrics and catchy melody. Mighty Gabby is well known in Barbados. He has composed over a thousand songs. Calypso is the style of music favored by most Barbadians. And for the people, Mighty Gabby is known as the King of Calypso. The Barbadian Calypso has always looked to both at the state level of social commentary and also the, the type of Calypso, which is much more uh, of the dance type. Um, so I would say, within a nutshell, that that encapsulates quite a bit of what uh, our culture is presented. It has that rhythm, that feel, that movement that, that our people are accustomed to hearing and living and feeling from the day they're born. And um, you know, a lot of our people, nine, over ninety percent of our people, are, are of African descent, and so. When you hear that music, when you hear the high note music of Nigeria, and you hear some of the other rhythms, you know, the sister rhythms, they're, they're so close to each other. Though Barbados and Africa are separated by a vast ocean, almost 90% of Barbadians originate from Africa. The humble sugarcane bears witness to three centuries of blood, toil, sweat, and tears of black African slaves. On the top of the coat of arms of Barbados is the strong fist of a Barbadian holding two stalks of sugar cane. This symbolizes the two major industries, cane planting and sugar production. Sugar cane is of incomparable importance to this Caribbean country. Sugar cane was introduced to the island by Jews from Dutch Brazil some 300 years ago. Ample sunshine and a tropical oceanic climate provide perfect conditions for the crop. When the British arrived several decades later, there were already 800 sugarcane plantations on the island. The plantation owners brought in a large number of slaves from Africa to this once desolate island as plantation laborers. The ratio of black plantation owners to black slaves back then is similar to the ratio of white and black Barbadians today. Since then, sugarcane has become the sole cash crop of the island and accounts for more than 90% of its total farmland. Barbados would soon become the richest nation in the Caribbean because of sugar. But with the changes in international market demand in recent years, Barbados is facing a transition.
At 8 a.m., Nichols receives a call from a supermarket for an order for several boxes of sweet potato. His weekly routine is to replenish stock in the supermarkets. I got a, a oral contract with Super Sender. So I do certain things for them. You know more or less the things are sold so long as you can produce them um, at a good quality. The soil actually before they are grown. The supermarket's selection of fruit and vegetables are a sight to behold, but most of them are imported and thus expensive. By contrast, the sweet potato delivered by Nichols is inexpensive and of good quality. The predominance of sugarcane on Barbados means that few farmers are able to grow vegetables. This means that Nichols is known far and wide for his vegetables. He bought this 60-acre farm 30 years ago. A tour of the farmland is a daily routine for this 71-year-old farmer. This is Christopher, you see. Then we got pumpkin in this area. We got um, a little bit of potatoes there that we harvesting now. And we're getting ready for carrots on the clean area. Then we got round sugar cane over yonder. Um, a bit of cabbage, carrot, beans, and then another set of beans. Nichols recalls that his forefathers were from Britain. His grandfather and father were good at planting sugarcane. He helped out in the plantation when he was still very young. Today, Nichols is caught by the most severe downturn in sugar production in recent years. Land previously used for planting sugarcane is now being turned into golf courses. Very few young people want to farm the land, but Nichols is not ready to give up. Well, you can take the senior acre and employ three people growing vegetables. You plant a crop of cabbage in the senior acre, or plant, plant the acre and cabbage, but in stages, you might make $15,000. Every three months you can have a piece of change. The king is a lazy man's job. <laughs> but you tell us if you really do work and involve and get yourself involved in the work, you're not a better guy. Nichols still keeps a small area for growing sugar cane. His workers cut and wash the cane and squeeze them for juice. This juice is then sent to the supermarkets in bottles. It's neither a big nor profitable business, but Nichols still wants to carry on. The way you plan to purchase is a key cleaning machine. Um, later, and we can buy by machine, I'd be happy to do that. Although he does not say so, it is clear, just like other Barbadians, that Nichols has a strong attachment to sugarcane. This is Cropover, a festival for celebrating the sugarcane harvest. From mid-May until the first weekend of August, Barbadians are caught up in a state of joyous revelry to celebrate the harvest. In that uh, festival, practically all elements of Barbadian culture is portrayed. And we have now a whole combination of events, from gospel to folk to um, to, to, to video and you know all types of events uh, the opportunity for Barbadians and visitors to to be on the street in a grand parade lots of color Barbados's unique geographical climatic and historical conditions have made it a kingdom of sugarcane but in addition to sugar production, rum is also being made by some brave people. This byproduct of sugarcane has also become a national treasure of Barbados. 
Two years ago, Dario realized his long-held dream to be a bartender. In addition to mixing drinks, he introduces local rum to international tourists. It's a product that the country is very proud of. His introduction includes the history and appreciation of rum and Barbadian rum culture. the designated oak casks, which keep the rum for a certain number of years. The rum, taken from the barrel, is mixed and diluted by the bartender before being served. Hyden Field's daily routine is to inspect these barrels. He has worked in the distillery warehouse for over 30 years. Uh, about 50 to 55 gallons of liquid in one barrel. The key to our making a good quality rum is you by leaving it in the barrel for a, a number of years. So because the longer it stays in the barrel, the better it would be. So there is when you will be able to get a premium product from it. If you age it for 10, 15 years, then when you bring it out, you have a nice, you can get a nice 17 or three rum from it. So the, essence of getting a premium and a good quality rum is aging it in the barrel for a certain period of time. You have to put the rum in the barrels so that it can age. When it goes into the barrel, it is like natural water, kind of water. But when it comes out, it begins to be it come out a color like amber brown. So the barrel helps give it a color. This is a special kind of wood. This is oak, oak wood. Mm -hmm. Alright, so uh, I believe it is the best type of thing because I never see any other different type of wood than oak, so... Rum production is not unique to Barbados, as almost every island in the Caribbean grows sugar cane and distills rum. But one thing is certain, no other country loves rum and sugar cane more than Barbados. Plantation houses built during the colonial period still stand on Barbados, each with their own sugar refinery and rum distillery. St. Nicholas Abbey is one of the most famous amongst them. It's a renowned tourist attraction that offers tourists rum distilled on the premises. In contrast to the peaceful atmosphere of St. Nicholas Abbey, Ginny Manor, only 10 kilometers away, is having its liveliest day. It's Thursday. People from far and wide come for a huge live broadcasting show called Q in the Community, produced by the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. The show starts at 10 a.m. and ends at midnight. It's the most joyous day of the week for many Barbadians. Hello, I have some friends here with me. We're going to talk to the ladies. 
first. Okay. Deborah. Deborah, tell me a little bit about you. Um, I still want to start coming to this one. Yeah, and just uh, about eight years ago, people who would call into the station and, and, and they, they were asking about uh, a place that people can come together and, and just socialize and have some fun. It grew from there and eight years later it's the biggest thing in, the, in, in Barbados, also the Caribbean. We have every Thursday at least uh, 3,000 people coming together to have a good time. They come and they congregate and they meet each other every Thursday. They play dominoes, they sing karaoke, they dance together. So it's, it's a time for them to, to showcase uh, themselves with, with other people. My name is Mildred Ford. I am 85 years old. I do the line dancing and any kind of dance. I'm a dancer. I could dance. But I go to church too, you know. I'm a church member. But I can't stand the house and stand out. Time and get older or seize up. So I come in and I decide the body. <laughs> Some attendees will prepare for this show a whole week early. They love it so much. Many come back year after year, and even sickness or injury won't keep them away. You know, they may have an injury. If anyone dies, don't bury them with Thursday, because I have to come to keep on giving them the Thursday. I met one gentleman, I think, a few months ago. And he said to me he lost his wife two years ago. He was really depressed. And someone told him about him before he came out. He's been uh, addicted to it ever since. It's therapeutic for people who would have gone through a lot of trauma in their lives. It brings uh, a certain energy. Uh, I mean, when people think of Q, they feel alive. You really see Bajan society. You see Bajans at their best. school teacher but here in Barbados we call it nursery the children are three and four years old um, and we pretty much just have a lot of fun at school um, we're teaching the kids their basic skills strengthening their fingers encouraging their literacy and their counting and their numeracy and I love my job I love my kids um, I wake up every day happy to come to work good morning teacher Barbados offers a high standard of social welfare. All citizens enjoy free education and health care. Even children from other countries who reside in Barbados for a certain time will receive free schooling until they enter university. As a teacher, Melanie is in a respectable profession and earns a decent income. She also has a part-time job. And if they're artists like me, they usually have to put time for their art after they do their day time job. So most artists in Barbados do their own their art in the evening and the weekend. Because if they have a daytime job, then they have to be committed to that because that pays them a salary that helps them to pay their bills at home, helps them to buy their groceries, stuff like that. Whereas the art farm that they're involved in does not pay as much as a regular daytime job. Melanie Hurley is a famous dancer in Barbados. She began at just three years of age. It's common for people to take dance lessons in Barbados, but very few of the youngsters become professional dancers. I've competed in our national festival for creative arts, NIFCA, with my dance groups. Um, we got a bronze, a silver and two year, two or three years ago we got a gold and we were the only gold in the competition. I knew that I loved to dance and I wanted to continue to take class and get better at what I did but 
when I decided to share with the rest of Barbados and hopefully the world my dad's talent. I was about 18 or 19 years old. Thursday evenings on the Jolly Roger pirate ship, Melanie performs Barbadian folk dances for three hours a night. Melanie does it for the joy it brings her, instead of the meager financial reward. It's a very fun dance. You just move to the music, and it's mostly in the waistline area. You just move to the music however you feel. So it's a lot of hips, a lot of angry, and it's enough for you to look up to whatever you're doing. And some people look at it and be like, what are they doing? But that's our culture dance. That's how we express ourselves. We hear the music, and we feel the music, and it moves through our body, and then we just move to the rhythm. We have great fun, and every time our meetings go, we have a good time. With sunshine, sea and sand, this charming and bountiful Caribbean island nation embodies tranquility, comfort, gentleness and courtesy. The Barbadians radiate humility, friendship, joy, harmony, vigour and vitality. They are the true definition of glamorous Barbados.